Yeah, I mean, we don't really talk anymore. You have to be doing TikTok, you have to be doing Facebook, whatever it is. I slept in the closet on an air mattress. Logan slept in his bed. But since we were daily vlogging, you kind of just had to improv and come up with things on the go. Filling swimming pools with slime and lighting mattresses on fire. You're watching the Jackson podcast. Woo! Jackson! And you're on the Jackson Podcast. I'm Bob Mentore. Make sure you stay tuned. The next episode will be a lot more normal and better than this one was. Take care, everyone. All right. So, Mark, I think a lot of people want to kind of get an inside look at how did you actually start your social media like empire, your following, your content, this network you build, your friend group? Like, how did it how did it start? So everything initially started back at college at Ohio University. I took broadcast journalism and I kind of didn't like the way that I was being taught about media. I really wanted to be a newscaster, but the way they taught us about negativity, always leading with these crime stories, fires, murders, robberies, whatever. So I really started getting into YouTube. I was watching Roman Atwood, FouseyTube, um, Casey Neistat, and then Logan Paul went to my school, and he did Vine at the time. So I just reached out to him on Twitter, and I was like, yo, like, let's make some videos. I was making these like party videos at my school, Ohio University, shout out. Um, we were the number one party school at the time. And then Logan liked my work ethic because I was filming everyone partying instead of partying. And then he flew out to California and then he wanted me to go out with him. And I was like, I mean, I do it. I don't have a million followers. I don't have a job. I need my college degree. I can't just like leave college after two years and then come out to L.A. So I finished my junior year and took all the classes that I needed to at campus so I could finish from L.A. my senior year. And I had one semester or half a semester left. No, yeah, one semester left, flew out to L.A., finished school in a closet, worked for Logan, got to meet all these Viners at 1600 Vine, and then kind of was just bored when Logan was doing his own thing, and I was just sitting around and had nothing to do, and I just started making skits. What was the relationship with you and Logan in terms of, you know, there's been a lot of talk, and a lot of people saw you. I actually got to watch this rise of you and Logan firsthand. I was always there with you guys. What was the relationship like? Were you creating for him? Were you editing? Were you a creator yourself? Where were you? Your, where was your mindset at going into that relationship? I think initially I just wanted to create content and he was creating content. So I reached out to someone who had a similar mindset as me. and was like, I wanted to be a YouTuber um, and he was making vines. And I said, hey, I'll shoot your vines for you. And we started doing that in Ohio. And then he flew out here and we started, you know, shooting, kept shooting his vines and he wanted to start his YouTube channel. So then he would come up with ideas and I would shoot them and then edit them and post them on his main channel. And then I would shoot his skits when we started moving on to Instagram and Facebook. And that's kind of really all I did for him. And then when he started vlogging, we lived together and we both vlogged. I didn't, uh, I didn't edit his videos when, when it came to vlogs. Um, we were just vlogging together and then kind of, you know, with friends. What was the creating process like when you and Logan Paul were making these videos? Were you guys like strategizing how you would make a vlog? Were Cause you guys, you besides Jake Paul, you guys were like the elite vlog manufacturers, you know, like you guys were creating the most dynamic vlogs. You guys were creating the most intuitive ways of like creating content. I think a lot of the performance paid media that these brands use today with reviews and on-screen text and UGC assets, like you guys were doing that five years ago, six years ago. So what was the creative process like? I think most of it was improv. I think you would go in kind of having this general idea of like, oh, my vlog is going to kind of be about this today. But since we were daily vlogging, you kind of just had to improv and come up with things on the go. I think we both just said yes to everything. So if someone would reach out and be like, hey, do you want to go skydiving? You're like, yes, like anything for content. And it just like you would do anything. Uh, typically, he would come up with like a the most viral videos weren't vlogs. They were centered around one idea for example his colorblind video he ordered these colorblind glasses um, and that went super viral and took off for him and the creative process was more so just improv winging it i would say do you think it's fair to call this original class of youtubers like the foozies the roman atwoods the casey nice are these like the originators of youtube creation and then you guys would be like the second generation 
No, I think you have your OG people like Jenna Marbles and PewDiePie, and then but the OG vloggers are actually. I mean, Roman Atwood was daily vlogging. FouseyTube was daily vlogging. Um, but they weren't really... Do- they were just filming their life. They weren't doing anything. Mm-hmm. And then Casey Neistat stepped up, and he was doing, like... People hadn't seen it before because it was super technical. He was, like, making it like a movie. He was just setting up a shot, walking outside, walking in the door. Like, he was making it more cinematic. And then I think Logan and Jake and I and that wave were just... Uh, I think Logan and Jake just set the bar extremely high. They were putting out daily content, doing the craziest stuff, like filling swimming pools with slime and lighting mattresses on fire and tasing people. Like they were just going next level crazy. And then that kind of like phased out the old YouTubers because people weren't watching like, Oh, I don't want to watch your boring life when Jake Paul's lighting a mattress on fire. So they kind of like, they didn't ruin YouTube. They just changed the landscape. Kind of like Mr. Beast has changed the landscape now. Do you think that this original landscape change with, Jake Paul and Logan. I mean, obviously Jake Paul's regardless of what anybody thinks about him. I personally think he's a great guy. I think he's one of the most creative guys on the internet and probably will be the most creative guy the internet's ever seen the way he's always dynamically changing. Same with Logan and your crew as well. But do you feel that Jake Paul and Logan Paul transformed YouTube's content creation? Yeah, I think the competitive nature of those two, they were always competing with each other, trying to be better than the other one or get more views or whatever. Um, they just made the quantity and quality aspect of YouTube like take off. And then now I think Mr. Beast has made the quality aspect take, take, take off. But I, the problem with YouTube now, everybody's doing the same thing. Like everybody's stealing ideas. Everybody's stealing thumbnails. Back when we were vlogging, we were all coming up with our like new ideas every single day. So I think it, I think. OG vlogs were way better than what YouTube is now. Do you think the OG vlog of like the full lifestyle aspect with a lot of dialogue, a lot of like people were like maturing their themselves through vlogging? Like I, I, for example, the team 10, I think is a great example. And you lived this all firsthand and you were a part of this transformation on YouTube, but we got to really learn about people on their vlogs. You got Mm -hmm. to really see their life. You got to really see what was going on in that. It was like this new form of reality show for our generation. And then now it's more of this competition base. How much money can you make? What can you do with a home and how many people can get a million dollars? And it's like all these clickbait content. It's very strategic and obviously it's going mega viral, but it's all based off these like clickbait concepts. When you were vlogging, what was your creation mind looking like? I mean, we clickbaited. Yeah. I think YouTube first started off as fun, fun, fun. And then you do one extreme thing and you see that it works. And you're like, oh, I'm going to do that again. Because if you look back at Logan and Jake's vlogs, it did start to become about like, oh, I spent $20,000 on this Rolex. Mm-hmm. I spent $150,000 on this car. It became about like flexing money. And Mr. Beast does the same thing. He, he flex. He doesn't literally like flex money. He's not like buying material things. I would say that Logan and Jake were entertainers. I don't really think that, yeah, they let you into their yeah, life, yeah, but they yeah. didn't like talk about their emotions. They didn't yeah. talk about like what they're going through yeah, in life. Yeah. They just were like, oh, my job is to entertain. Same thing with Mr. Beast. Mm-hmm. I personally, the, the older I get, the, I'm, more, I'm more so like uh, human content. Like, oh, like if someone talks about a struggle, what they're going through or a business, for example, like mm-hmm. the older I get, the more that I care kind of more about knowledge rather than being like, whoa, dude, like he put a million Orbeez in a pool. That's fucking cool. Like, I'm 29, dude. Yeah. Yeah. You're like, I'm good. (laughs) Yeah. Where do you see the transformation of content creators going now? Like, obviously, you're a lot older. I've been watching you since you were super young. Um, We used to go out and party and we used to go do events. And, you know, Logan and Jake and everybody was making music. And I was on tour with Jake watching him do this. And I got to watch you firsthand create content, then create music, then create music videos. You shot a music video at my SC Village paintball park. And I've really watched you mature over the years in content creation. You were probably one of the most elite content creators at one point in terms of working with platforms before Mm -hmm. anybody even knew what a platform was or used that buzzword because you had an amazing Facebook deal. You were making six figures a year. You were one of Facebook's first original content creators. I was watching you in your home, in this attic with 20 computers, yeah. build out Facebook shows and content creation. And I ha- saw George Janko and Logan always coming through your house. And you really set the bar for what content quality looked like. I don't think your quantity was as, you know, amassed as Jake with a vlog every day yeah. and it's everyday bro, but your quality <laughs> was insane. Yeah. Where is it now? What What is the transformation look like now? I hope to see like a transformation back to high quality content. I think TikTok is really ruined people's attention span. 
Like you can't even, you know, watch something without Maze Runner underneath it. You know, like people can't pay attention unless there's a lot of things happening. There's a lot of like ADD going on. But I would love to see it go from the problem with TikTok is it's more so qual- uh, quantity, not quality. Because mm-hmm. you're just scrolling. Like if you think back at like the last ten TikToks, you're not going to remember ten TikToks. And that's it's so competitive. And I think COVID and TikTok really transformed the game because people got bored and then everybody became a creator like mm-hmm. in their free time. And that's the crazy thing too about people with small businesses. You can't just have a business anymore. You have to be do like you have to be doing TikTok, you have to be doing Facebook, whatever it is. And it's just becoming a lot for people just because the landscape's changing. But I wish I, I do wish that high I think high quality content uh, is superior. And in what way do you think is it because it takes more of a masterful creative process or do you think just because it's easier to kind of win now in that lane? I think it's just more. I appreciate it more. Mm -hmm. I mean, like I said, I liked Casey Neistat and I liked I appreciated the quality of his videos and same thing with Devin Supertramp. Those guys were big inspirations to Mm -hmm. me and they were just more on the film side of things rather than. um, I don't know, like. I've never filmed in house on a TikTok app. Like it's weird to me. I would rather like edit it and like take the yeah. time to think about yeah. it. And when you say in house, you mean like using the app, yeah. stop starting. Yeah. You'd rather create it on a real camera, quality content, good lighting. Right. Yeah. So I guess that there's still that love for creating quality content is what you have that a lot of people maybe I do, don't have. but I yeah. think in today's day and age you kind of have to put out quantity first. Yeah. To grow. You have to do mystery. To grow your like, platform. You have to grow your platform with quantity, repetition. People need to keep seeing you. And the second you stop posting, people stop caring. We see so many influencers popping up back in your day, like in the heyday of social media, when you guys were all living in this 1600 vine, there was an amazing floor of just the greatest content yeah. creators the world's ever seen. Amanda Cerny, Logan Paul, Jake Paul, Fousey, you, George Janko. We would leave a nightclub, it'd be two in the morning, we'd come back and this this floor was literally the most iconic floor in yeah. probably nightlife with the best after parties and the best 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 content creators. Yeah. What was that lifestyle like? What what was going on at that moment in social media? Honestly, it was it was the best formula for creating content to be surrounded in basically a frat house of people that all did the same thing as you. So if you come up with an idea, you could hit up, you know, Christian Del Grosso who's down the hall and he's like, "Oh, no, I can't today." Then you hit up Anwar and he's like, "Oh, I can't today." Then you hit up Marcus Johns and you hit up Lance 210. Like you always had someone who had millions of followers who was willing to go shoot something and then it's like, "Oh, if I'm shooting with Amanda Cerny, um, and she comes up with an idea. She's like, hey, can you come be in this video? And then I'm like, oh, fuck, I got to think of an idea that I can shoot with Amanda while I'm there really quick. So you were just constantly collaborating. This wow. was like this funnel of people. And it's probably the best formula. Like, I know people try to do like the Team 10 house or mm-hmm. the Hype house, whatever. I think what the issue is with those is everybody is under this like, oh, like, I don't know. They, like, they own a percentage. So like the business side of it's bad. Mm-hmm. But the cool thing about 1600 Vine was everyone had their own room an apartment so you weren't like living with your business partners you all got to go back to your house and then no one owned a percentage of each Mm -hmm. other Mm -hmm. so like there was you know for the for majority of the time ego was left at the door but then i think ego started to you know happen what was the landscape in terms of who was living there and like what you guys would actually do to create content like tell some some of the most viral moments that happened there who was living there i mean it was when I first moved out to LA, it was in my two bedroom. I'm not going to say mine. It was Logan's two bedroom apartment. I slept in the closet on an air mattress. Logan slept in his bed. So we shared a room. And then Jake Paul was in the other room with all I call it like his team 10 minions. Like he had Alyssa Violet, Niels, the Dobre bro- twin brothers. Uh, I think the Dolan twins stayed there for, for a little bit. Like he had like 10 people sleeping in his uh yeah. Room. I remember I went over one time for lunch. It was literally like 12 people in one room. Yeah, it was bizarre. Uh, and me, I was like the older guy who went to college, graduated college. So I was like, bro, I'm living with a bunch of like 18, 17 year olds. And I was like 22 at the time. I remember I had to go grab a t-shirt and Logan was there. I was like, yo, I need a tea. And you were like in the closet. I was like, this guy's Harry Potter. Like you're living underneath the stairs, like in a closet. And I was like, this is your room. It's like a mattress, shoes, some shirts. And you're like underneath the hoodies. Yeah. I'm like, all right, this is amazing. (laughs) This is social media. But I think that's why it was so fun. It was so raw. It was so natural. So young. It wasn't about, it was about the content. It was Mm -hmm. about everybody was passionate about making videos and we just did it for fun. And it was like, cool, we get to wake up. And like, that was our hobby. Like someone played basketball or whatever, any sports, you that's your hobby. Our hobby was making videos. And then- it, and were you guys all making money at the time? 
Dude, I wasn't making shit. I mean, I got free rent, but yeah, I slept in the closet. I think I, got, I made like a thousand bucks a month. And, and what about Jake and Logan and all those guys? I mean, they were making money. Yeah. Was it, were they making money off brand deals or like AdSense? Like the this YouTube was, I paid. mean, be, before YouTube, brand deals. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they were making tons of money off brand deals. And then YouTube vlogging came around and they were making, you know, six figures off. What's like one of the biggest brand deals you saw go down? From someone else or yeah, from me? Yeah, from someone else. I, we never talked about that. Really? Yeah. I never, you guys never talked about money? I never talked. No, never. And so at that time, was everybody working together really cohesively and it was a good environment? I think everybody was working together until Vine died. And then everyone's like, oh, fuck. It's kind of every man for themselves now. Okay. And everybody, like I said, ego took over. Some people had more followers. So, so Vine died. And then what did it transition to? Transitioned over to Instagram and Facebook. And Facebook, I think, heavy for a little bit. Instagram skits. Fortunately, a lot of people think I started on Vine. I actually started on Instagram skits, mm -hmm. which if looking back, people were asking me like, yo, how are you growing so fast? Like, cause I did, I mean, obviously I was shooting with all these people, but looking back, I, they just introduced 60 second video. So whenever a platform introduces a new feature, you have to attack that feature. And that's how I grew. So Instagram really? was more so a photo app and 15 second videos. And then they introduced 60 second videos. So I started making 45 to 60 second skits and they were all getting millions of views going on the explore page. Um, and then I was able to build my Instagram following up to like half a million. And then that's when our, then Logan and I, and everybody was like, Casey Neistat told us, he's like, you need to start doing YouTube vlogs and stuff. So then we started daily vlogging. So Casey Neistat called you guys and said, yo, you guys are blowing up. It's time for you guys to transition to YouTube. Yeah. I wow. remember him coming over, but Lance 210 was doing it as well. And he was our next door neighbor and he was like showing us his numbers and how fast he was growing. So we all started vlogging and then you just kind of like push your vlog to your Instagram and your Instagram to your vlog. Um, Did the landscape of brand money and revenue and how you guys were making money, was it mainly from paid ads from YouTube itself, the platform, or was it from brands paying you guys to be in your videos? You definitely make more from a brand. Got it. Like say, got it. Um, like I did a deal with Harley Davidson. Like mm -hmm. they pay me $40,000 to post an Instagram picture, but like, I mean, most YouTube videos, you don't make $40,000 on a YouTube video unless it's getting like, yeah. you know, millions and millions of For views. For people that don't know YouTube, at the time that Jake was getting like a million to two million to three million views every day, and so was Logan, and they were posting. I think they were getting more. I think we were getting like 10 day. Yeah. Like each vlog was getting 10 million views. At that time? I think so, yeah. So what did that translate in terms of paid money from YouTube itself as a platform? I don't know. I never saw their stats. But what did it do like in general for you? Or like how did that work for people that don't really understand YouTube? Because I think a lot of people are kind of like confused about how these influencers make money yeah, like yeah. from YouTube videos. Okay, so YouTube, when you watch a YouTube video, there's an ad. Mm -hmm. And I guess YouTube takes, I think, 50% and they mm -hmm. give 50%. Maybe it's 70, 30. I don't know. But say whatever, a company has a budget. Coca-Cola pays YouTube $100,000 and YouTube puts ads on, you know, they probably give them demographics. And then if someone watches an ad on your YouTube video, you get half that money that Coca-Cola paid. And I think it comes out, like, it depends on your niche or whatever, but uh, the CPMs are like, what, like $4 to, if you do finance or like anything like that, it's like 30 per million. So per, do you feel, do you feel that there was certain YouTubers that were being, a little bit more favored from YouTube in terms of the ads money they were getting. Have you heard of that? Or was it mainly oh, yeah. just like a partner program? Yeah, I think so. I'm not sure though. I was mm -hmm. never in it. Got it. Oh, yeah. you never, never, YouTube I was never a YouTube partner, but I was never like, perf I got on the trending page like one time, dude. Yeah. And I was getting like a million views a video. Yeah. It was pretty like, I was like, what is going on? Like, how do these, all these guys are always going trending, trending, trending. But yeah. And what did your, your following count and your subscriber count? How fast did that rise? How did that work? So my friend Wampa Zarita, he was huge in Mexico. He yeah. actually, when I first started YouTube, because he was a big YouTuber at the time, he uh, he told me if you stay consistent and post on the same days that you say you're going to post, and you have to do it. If you do three months of consistency, that's when your channel is going to take off for YouTube. Like you need to dedicate three months and be consistent, or else you're not going to be successful. Got it. Um, so the first three months, I gained I think a hundred thousand subscribers after three months. And then I was like, ah, like, I mean, that was a lot, but like, I was like, when's my channel going to take off? You know, like I made all these videos, they were doing pretty well. Um, and then that one video goes viral and then your channel just goes. So you make a lot of videos for little, but then when one takes off, like your channel grows because you have all this backlog of like all these videos that people can see after that viral one. And I remember I did a, 
it was a really last minute video actually. And I didn't, I, I just had to get a video up because mm -hmm. I had to hit my Monday, mm -hmm. Wednesday, Friday. And it was on a Friday and this guy hit me up. He was a seven foot tall guy. He's like, Hey man, I live in LA. Like I'm seven feet tall. Like let's make a video together. I was like, what are you doing today? Like come over. And I came up with an idea on the spot. I was like, yo, my friend Ayla is like four foot 10. Like we should do a blind date where I set up this seven foot tall guy with this four foot tall girl and whatever. Make the video. I post it so late the next day because uh, it was last minute. I posted like at 5 p.m. on a Friday and I was like, I shouldn't even post it because it's so late. Went super viral. My channel gained like 250,000 subscribers and then yeah so for a lot of content creators that look at their content in terms of like feeling defeated and feeling like their pages and taking off you're saying that the consistency it has to stay no matter what yeah yeah it's interesting though because i feel like a lot of people that create content don't really even have a game plan going into it they just create to create they jump on every trend they jump on every yeah. fad and there's no consistency to their content well the thing about being a content creator that uh, the difference between a content creator and someone who creates content is a lot of people, when they see a TikTok, they're like, oh, I'm going to do that. That was funny. They just do the same thing. That's not a creator. A creator will take that piece of content and they'll be like, that was funny. What can I do to make it better? Right. And then they, that's how you build your right. own identity. And I always tell people it's when they're starting off. Think of, say you want to be a YouTuber. Take five YouTubers. Um, take one thing from each YouTuber that you like and then add that to yourself. And then that's how you become your own identity. For example, I liked K Casey Neistat's rawness. I liked um Devin super tramps he had smooth camera shots I like David Dobrik how he's he's like a sitcom and he laughs so you incorporate all these elements from other people that you enjoy watching yeah. and then you bring that into yours without stealing so you know I would do something like Casey in one video and I would laugh after someone tells a joke because I'm like oh I noticed that in David's video so you kind of like build your own identity and then you start to build your own style by replicating people but not fully ripping them off what, what were your five influences like from youtubers I'd say Casey Neistat was number one. I liked Roman Atwood. Devin Supertramp. Um, David Dobrik. And then this guy named Justin Escalona. Oh, yeah, I love Justin. You know, yeah, yeah, yeah. one of my good friends. Yeah, he, yeah. I, I got an idea from him. He used to do these things called cinematic sequences. Mm -hmm. And I thought they were super cool. And then I did something in my videos called Cue the Cinema. And it was like a similar concept, but... Yeah, I think Justin went to USC film yeah, school, yeah. super creative. He has a brand. And then obviously um, Sam Colder, mm -hmm. the dude's a legend, mm -hmm. like one of the best. What is it about David Dobrik or Fousey Tuber, these like iconic YouTubers now that just help them go to that next level? What do you think it is that creates that superstardom on YouTube? Consistency. Really? Consi and, and having a cast. I think it's very hard. Like, I think there's some anomalies like Emma Chamberlain, but it's very hard to make some one watch your video if you're the only one in it why like is when that because you, you like think about any good tv show you have friends and you have seinfeld like i like seinfeld so i didn't watch seinfeld because i like jerry i liked it because kramer was funny and george was funny so like in david dobrik's videos you have david dobrik is jerry seinfeld but then you have you know jonah you have zane and heath and corinna you have this whole cast so some people might, might not david's not even in his videos you know what I mean? People are watching, but David is the one that's loved because he's doing all these things for his friends. Mm -hmm. It's like Seinfeld. Yeah. So do you feel that YouTube now has transitioned to a place where you have to kind of look at it as like a show, like a TV show? Yeah, I think, I mean, look at Mr. Beast. He's got a cast and crew. Mm -hmm. And if Mr. Beast just started doing things alone, do you think people are going to watch him? Just mm -hmm. him sitting yeah. in front of a camera for 10 minutes. Yeah. It's kind of boring. So how do you think social media is working now in terms of like Facebook and TikTok and Twitter, you know, and Instagram and them all interacting with each other? How do you think that landscape works now for a content creator and a brand? Like, how should they look at that? I think for me, and I've taken a step back from creating, it's very overwhelming because you have to sit here and create content for TikTok, for Snapchat, for Facebook, for Instagram, for YouTube. Like, you, you really like... The only ones that you're making money on are YouTube. That's the only guaranteed platform you can like post a video and you'll make AdSense if you get into the monetization program. But you post an Instagram, you know, real, you're not making money. You have to like have a side job where you get actually paid. And then hopefully while you're doing this side business, you can get a brand deal. So I think what these platforms need to do is they need to just pay the creators. Instead of Instagram charging $15 a month for a blue check mark, why don't they charge... 25 cents for a fan to follow a creator and the fan the, the creator gets that 25 cents so if i get a million followers i just made two hundred fifty thousand dollars, 
and I can actually create content for a living and it costs the viewer 25 cents. But then Instagram, this or Facebook, this company that's worth whatever, hundreds of billions of dollars, they're like, how can we make more money? And then they charge for a verified check and it's like, bro, pay your fucking creators because without the people on the app, your app doesn't succeed. Yeah, I mean, even the the blue check mark is like, I got verified a few years ago. Now everybody has one. It's like, they should have just made the paid verification logos green so right. everybody knows those were paid for. And if you're really doing it because you're scared or fearful of the creator having multiple impersonation accounts, well, then just have it iconic different. Yeah. But this icon that they made that's supposed to be so iconic is not different. And now they just blended that all together. Yeah, and I think... They try to introduce like, oh, you could subscribe to someone and support a creator for $5 a month. But that's like, how many creators are you going to support for $5 a month? How easy would it be? I came up with this idea and I think it's a great idea. Would you follow someone if it costs you a quarter? Yeah, if my card was linked, I would pay a quarter to all my friends. Right? It's and it's a one-time fee. And, and I know it's going towards their content. And maybe even to add more money in there, if you want to unfollow someone, it's another quarter. I think that's And then honestly, it gets rid of bots. Yeah, I think that's honestly <laughs> why OnlyFans and Patreon and all these brands are succeeding is because creators are going there knowing they can make more money. And there, dude, there's so many fighters, pro surfers, skateboarders, people that are just models, fitness trainers that are going to OnlyFans as just a way to have a built-in formula to attain money because there's not a lot of platforms that give them the ability to even get money. But because of the stigma of OnlyFans or certain, you know, Patreon or whatnot, people are fearful of that. But those are actually the best platforms. It's a built-in formula to make money. Right. And there's, I think with Instagram to change to monetization, like if they went to monetization, it's like, oh, you were free before and now you're charging. What's interesting to me is if you think about it, like, for example, it costs the viewer zero dollars to watch any YouTube video of mine, any Instagram video or mm -hmm. TikTok. It's zero dollars. What's interesting to me is that people will pay large corporations. They'll, they'll have a Spotify account. They'll have an Apple Music account. They'll have a Netflix, a Hulu. Uh, and they'll pay for a verified check on Instagram. They pay all these subscriptions to these big multi, multi billion dollar corporations. But then, you know, a creator will come along and be like, hey, guys, like, I'm releasing a song and it would mean a lot if you, you know, could buy it for a dollar twenty nine. They're like, whoa, whoa, a dollar twenty nine? Like I could just listen to it on Spotify. But like they're they're not willing to support a creator, but they're willing to support a multi billion dollar business. Yeah. I think it's just the mindset that these corporations have been able to kind of brainwash dude they, they've been able to kind of program people to understand that hey listen if you're paying us you get all of this if you pay them you just get that and they know that there's a lot of ways where they can kind of build in their business model to be a little bit more creator friendly but at the end of the day it's business and it's profit profit over people and yeah. i talk about this all the time this profit over people concept too many businesses are really not focused on the vision of the business. They're just focused on pleasing a board, making their stock go up, making sure that people are happy with their job because they're really not doing anything. It's a lot of, a lot of executives, you know, controlling a yeah. lot of people that are semi-executives who are supposed to manage semi-semi-executives before you even get to the actual labor force that's making motion or programming or coding. So there's I mean, even so with, many chains of command. I'm grateful for my Facebook deal that I had when they did Facebook watch. Yeah. Like it changed my life truly. Um, but the, just a prime example, my Facebook page has been banned essentially because I posted a picture of Jeffrey Dahmer, um, eating a cheeseburger at five guys with like, it was like a meme and I got banned because I went against their guidelines of dangerous individuals and organizations Really, for just posting Jeffrey Dahmer's face on another person. And the fact that like, like what you said, these corporations can control like, my page literally says not recommendable. Like I used to get 20 million views on a Facebook reel. I posted after getting uh, the, the Dahmer check. I got 3000 views. I posted again, 4,000 posted again, 2000. Like they just killed my page. So uh, this page that I spent years building to a million and a half followers, it's gone. And so do you feel that these pages that become shadow banned or whatever term people like to use on the internet is possible to revive? Or do you feel like you have to start a new platform, a new page? I mean, it'd be more beneficial for me to start over. Wow. And how many subscribers, how many followers do you have on that Facebook page? 1.6 mil. Wow. And I get, I, I'll, I could post a picture and it gets two likes. Unbelievable. Completely shadow banned. And on the back end, it literally says your page is not recommendable. Like it tells me like yeah. what, when I got the strike, it says we're not going to be recommending your page anymore for one mistake in seven years.
for posting Jeffrey Dahmer. And were you eating able to call him? What? Were you able to call him? Any technical support? Bro, the back or that was a whole disaster in itself. I don't want to get into that, but like, yeah, basically my page is fucked. And so what, like as a creator, I'm sure there's so many people that go through this. Their page gets shadow banned. Their page gets no engagement. They were going and then they stall out. How does a creator overcome this? How do you now look at yourself and say, okay, well, I know I'm the best at what I do. What, what's your game plan? How do you look at that? I guess it's got to overcome adversity. And in I'm what just, way? Like, I, Well, I could start a new page. Will I do that? Probably not because I don't really like use Facebook. I'm, I'm like on the cusp of like the person that doesn't use Facebook since I'm 29. I feel like it's like an older demographic. But yeah, you just got to attack TikTok, I guess, Instagram Reels, um, and YouTube. I think YouTube is going to be and will forever be the superior platform. So what do you look at now going into this new phase? You just came back from a four-month hiatus in Germany. You have a, uh, your, your, your wife with you over here um, in a beautiful relationship. So what do you look at now as the landscape for you, Mark Donor, as a content creator? How do you go into Facebook, TikTok, YouTube specifically? What kind of content are you looking at to create for those? I think just go back to my roots. I, uh, I was talking about this the other day. I think I lost sight of why I started making content first place because you start to get right. clouded by the numbers. Right. And you first start making content as a passion. You're like, yeah, I really enjoy what I do. And then you, the money takes over, the numbers take over and you're like, Oh really? Like I really got to start up in the game because mm -hmm. if my views go down, my money goes down and this is my job now. So it starts to consume you. But what I'm trying to do is just go back to the roots, go back to right. making videos that I like, because if I like the video, there's gotta be someone out there that else that likes the video. And if I just stay like to that consistent three month plan of hitting the times that I say that I'm going to post. So my my fans, I've been, I, you have to really build your fan loyalty. Mm -hmm. I really lost my fan loyalty because I was so inconsistent over the past few years. I would post a video and I would be let down that it didn't do well, but it's on me that it didn't do well because I'm not being consistent. And then I would like take three weeks and post another video. So why would you watch me? Why, you know, you lost that. I used to post every day. Yeah, they lost now the Mark, connection. Yeah, and yeah, they lost the connect. Now Mark can't even put out a video every month. And with me, I've made like 700 vlogs. I've made 100 podcasts, hundreds of skits. My problem is I'm not, I, I don't have any ideas. Like when you film your life every day for two years straight and then you're in, you know, Logan Paul and Jake Paul's videos, you know, in thousands of other videos every single day, you kind of start running out of shit to say, you know, like I, I feel like my story's been told. That's why I like, that's why you have to go back to the David Dobrik of like having a cast. It's like, okay, my story has been told on the internet to me you know, hundreds of times. So now I have Taylor, my girlfriend, and I could tell her story a little bit. And mm -hmm. people are like, oh, like a new character, mm -hmm. you know? Build a new storyline. Yeah. I feel like you have to create with a passion, right? You have to create yeah. with value. And I think the most important thing to me is I always tell brands this, like you should be not engaging in conversation. You should be starting conversation. You should be the one coming up with ways for your audience to engage with you and ways for people to interact with you. I think people lose sight of the fact that when you create content, you're giving someone an outlet to forget about their life for a second. You're yeah. giving someone the ability to stop and kind of marinate on what you're showing and lose track a little bit about their stress or their struggles. And a lot of people, they tend to embody this, you know, consistency, but they also have a lot of duplicated content. And now that user, they become stagnant, they become confused, and then they just become bored. And that's the problem with so many creators that you get the Jake Paul syndrome where it's like, I gotta light my whole house on fire because yeah. my audience is bored, where it's like, whoa, slow down. You know, you maybe just do a little s'more campfire. You don't need to light the whole thing on fire. But watching this in real time, I watched you do it. I watched Logan and George and Jake. And, you know, I watched all these content creators at their height. And Fousey, you know, one of my closest friends, I watched him do the entire concert, you know, yeah, and I was yeah. standing there on top of the car with him. And it's like, dude, like, Sometimes we just have to remember because you guys are superstars. You are modern day actors, modern day celebrities. But the problem is, is the stigma between old Hollywood and new Hollywood is like, well, they're a creator. Well, it's like, yeah, yeah. the creator gets more views than your entire network does in a whole month in one day. So let's, yeah. let's put a little respect on their name. That's something that's always been confusing to me, why people look down on creators. I remember when I first started daily vlogging, people were like, so what do you do? I'm like, oh, I vlog. They're like, what does that mean? I'm like, I film my life. And they're like, oh, that's so easy. I could do that. Tell me you could daily vlog and put out a 15 to 20 minute video every single day of your life. Bro, my one friend, he, he started vlogging and he was like on day three. He's like, dude, I don't know how you did this for two years straight. It's like, it's so much harder than, and, but like, it's so weird. You know, people respect celebrities so much who have this whole team. And then they're like, oh, this guy just films his life or this yeah. guy just makes people laugh. 
And it's like, yeah, well, you build an empire too. Like, yeah. Yeah, I've watched you do it. I mean, I was in your house when you were editing music videos yeah. and you were editing songs while you were filming, while you were working on a clothing line and you had a podcast yeah. and we had Mike Posner on your podcast and yeah. you were listening to him play, took a pill in Ibiza, going straight back into the studio to finish your song and then go finish another vlog. Yep. And it's like, people don't look at the grind, but you guys are the elite of the elite creators and you're the you're the reason why brands duplicate content. You're the reasons why brands look at content that end up paying you millions of dollars is because they're trying to figure out what to do. And you guys have your pulse exactly on what's going on in the world. I, I always found it so interesting. I love it. I made it my whole life as well, just from the business side, you know, but you know, watching you do, it was always amazing. What's your relationship right now with guys like Logan Paul and George Janko, this Jake Paul, this crew that yeah. you kind of like, I, 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 over the last 10 years was around and was around you. Yeah, I mean, we don't really talk anymore, truthfully. Like, we used to be best friends, roommates, yeah. and then kind of just, you know, all went and did our own thing. Um, is there bad blood between all of you guys, or is it just like, because, you know, we see George on Impulsive. Yeah. We know George was your best friend. I don't friend. think he's we on there Logan. anymore. He's not on Impulsive? No, I don't think so. Completely? I don't think so. I thought that was just for Twitter. I don't know. I yeah. mean, maybe I'm fooled too, but yeah. I, I don't think he's on there anymore. Um, yeah, I mean, we could, we've had our ups and downs as friends. I'm not you know, here to speak ill about anyone. Yeah, like, of course. It's great. There's things I could have done better in our friendships. And then there's things that they could have done better in the, the friendship. But, but is there a line of communication still open between you and George and you and Logan and you and Jay? Yeah, I've talked to George. Like I've sent him a text here and there like, hey man, thinking of you, like hope everything's well. Cool. Um, yeah. Logan, not so much, but I mean, I haven't talked, I don't even have Jake's number anymore. I don't think, but yeah. Yeah. Do you find it weird that like this crew of friends and you know, there was like the older group and the younger group, right? We'd go to a party. I'm driving Jake and the boys. And then it's yeah. like you, Logan and George and the other car. We all go to the party together. We all leave to the party together. But it was like, you guys had a crew. Jake had a crew. Do you find it weird that it's like two brothers, two families, but it's like all kind of mixed now, but those are like the originators of what's going on in the world. Like, and they're still at the top of the game. I mean, those guys, they have such insane work ethic. And uh, I don't think people talk about that enough. Yeah. Jake and Logan are the two most hardest working people on social media. And one thing I will say, they will not let anyone get in the way of them achieving their goals. I remember when I first moved in with Logan, he had a, some, I think it was like a piece of paper on the wall that on his mirror. And it said, I will be the biggest entertainer in the world. And he would look at himself every single day in the mirror and say, I will be the, he was like manifesting. I will be the biggest entertainer. Like that is his ultimate goal that he's been saying ever since he moved out to Hollywood and look at him. I mean, now he's on the WWE, he's doing prime, he's crushing it. And I think Jake's goal was, uh, to be a billionaire. I think that mm -hmm. was mainly, that's why it was called team, team 10, 10, like 10 digits. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, Jake's not going to stop till he's a billionaire. And those guys are so competitive that Logan's not going to let Jake outshine him and Jake's not going to let Logan outshine. Yeah, I don't, I mean, they're the two most hard and working guys and they work hard and they grind and they want everything, but they also succeed in almost everything they go after. I think that's not talked about enough. You know, Jake did YouTube and then he did music and then he did acting and then he did, you know, boxing. He also did the touring same yep. way. Logan and and I know you've been there through kind of like that whole ride and you were there with these guys and I saw how good of a friend you were to guys like George and guys like Logan. I think, you know, even the way you, interacted with George and Logan before all of you guys were all superstars on social media was always admiring how you guys were real. Like you guys were real friends and you were always real with me. We'd go out all the time. You're always there to be a, a good friend. Do you feel that the way Jake attacks, like say for example, boxing, it's very unique. It's very out of the box. Same with Logan, the way Logan attacks collecting Pokemon cards or the way he attacks going to WWE. Like the way they strategize is almost comparable. Like they, it's almost as if they're the reasons why they're so successful is because they keep trying to outdo each other. I think so. Yeah. yeah. They just constantly want to one up each other. And I think too, with them, they're very smart because they both involve themselves in controversy. And mm -hmm. I think everybody can agree that to be successful, the, some of the biggest celebrities, the biggest names out there have had some sort of controversy. Yeah. yeah. And it's like all press is good press, or what yeah. Is it? yeah, all press is good, or bad press is good press. I don't know what the saying all is. All press but is good press. All press is good press. So like, and as long as you fight through those controversies, then you're, you're going to be a superstar. Yeah. 